Hi, everyone. Today I'm joined by Susan Cook Greuter. Uh, Susan is the writer and a developmental psychologist, uh, independent scholar, uh, notable for work on uh, ego development theory, um, which uh, I've been reading a lot of Susan's work, uh, starting with this one, which is, uh, I believe, well, we'll talk about this in a second, but I believe this was your dissertation um, on post autonomous ego development. Um, also, probably a lot of people will be familiar with um, the nine levels of uh, increasing ego embrace, which is actually something I uh, had printed so I could read it in in print instead of in a digital file. Uh, but anyway, um, really meaningful and important work in the uh, field of developmental psychology around the issue of ego development. And um, yeah, I really appreciate you being here. I'm looking forward to asking you a, a number of questions about this theory and this model. Uh, but first of all, yeah, just thank you very much. Appreciate you coming on. Thank you for having me. We'll Lovely. see what emerges. Yeah, <laughs> as always. So, okay. I'm going to presume that a lot of people, I'm just going to presume everyone who's watching this is vaguely familiar with uh, uh, this model um, because I don't want to waste your time or their time going through the whole model um, mm -hmm. when especially these works exist, people can acquaint themselves. So I'd love to get into some of the, uh, some other stuff that, um, that questions I've had and maybe some meaningful background uh, around all this. So um, I guess first question is, what's your background with this? How did you how did you personally come into this field? I know that this dissertation, um, uh, Robert Keegan was the chair. I know you've worked with uh, Michael Commons, but uh, talk a little bit about um, yeah how you how you landed in um, uh, developmental psychology and what sort of that uh, career looked like. I was trained or grew up in a very humanistically oriented elitist environment. So I was familiar with interesting ideas from very young on. Uh, I studied in Zurich. I focused primarily on linguistics, but also did special needs and other things. And the linguistic part had to do with realizing from reading literature in all kinds of languages, even in high school, how different uh, worldviews are embedded in the languages. And that mm. was a basic curiosity. And then when I moved to America in 76 to marry and to start a new life, uh, I also realized I needed my, my foreign degrees to count in the United States. I had to go back to school. And the first year I was back at Harvard, it, I discovered developmental psychology. And it felt like, and Love Angels in particular, which is based on... Uh, analyzing language that people produce to it in response to a test. And that was like a married marriage in heaven for me. <laughs> and I'm still combining the two. I think I'm the most versed in looking at language in that more in that broader way than other people. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, that's that. That I'm glad you brought up language because I, I have a couple of questions I want to get into around that. Um, it, well, but just to tie a bow on that. So then, uh, so at Harvard, then you worked with uh, with Keegan and and did I assume this dissertation I was just holding I up did, a second ago? I, I, yeah, for two years I was just getting a master's, and then I became an independent scholar. You're right, and I brought up children. Did the usual. <laughs> You know, I wrote I, I wrote papers, I presented at conferences, and then I went back because I realized that's so interesting how academia works. I wrote two books with Mel Miller, and they were both well received, they're still in print and all that. But every time we wanted to present, it had to be him the first author because he was at the university mm -hmm. and I was a nobody. An independent scholar. Right. Well, I, I, I can sympathize with that because that's how I myself identify as an independent scholar. And uh, yeah, so I, I, I know what you're getting at. It can, anyway, trust, it, yeah. it, in the long run, I went back to school. Also, I'm just in, enormously curious. I always have been. And I think that's still the case. And got the PhD. And I realized very early on, right after I learned how to do the scoring of the Levinger test, that there were 
empty spaces that she actually didn't understand late the stage development. And when I suggested that I might, that I could write about it, she simply dismissed me mm. and said, you know, you're crazy. Nobody can understand that stuff. <laughs> and I I always called my theory Lovinja Kukreuter. And she said, no, 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 give it your own name. I have never listened to her in that sense. It's so basically based on her work that I feel it needs to say that I'm standing mm. on her shoulders, mm. even if I did some other things with it. Well, that is actually a question, too, I wanted to ask you is, do you see uh, your model as being basically just stacked on top of Lovinger's model? Or do you think... No, it... it's it's really rethinking it. What Rethinking I've it. Always been the, if you want to use the word proud or happy with, was discovering this perspective taking mm -hmm. that to me is the core that that's the heart uh, structure below the rest and she mm -hmm. didn't have that and Colbert was adamant that his theory was structurally and hers was not so <laughs> I was happy to say well if you look hard enough and if you look you know, then you can see the underlying structure, the undergirding uh, properties. Well, great. So talk about that, because that actually is one element that I have trouble getting just from the written work alone. Could you walk me through the perspectives that you that you outline, like what like all the way from fourth to fifth I into those perspectives? Because um, you have these interesting diagrams. But in terms of like intuitively wrapping my head around those, it sounds like this is very crucial to kind of get the architecture of what these different ego stages are, though. So I don't know. Maybe could you could you go through the, the like different okay. the different perspectives? Yeah. Okay, so great. when you're very early, the only perspective you can have is your own, and the rest of the world is like your oyster. Everything is there to serve you. That's a one the first perspective. Then a little later, when you get socialized in kindergarten and such, you start seeing the other perspective you see that they see you and you see them and that that's a new kind of interaction between first and second perspective and then a major psychological piece of growth is when you start having a third person perspective on yourself that means you can take yourself as object mm. you can start observing that maybe you were a little different in the past than you're today or you start to notice patterns. I'm usually on time. I'm a reliable person. So you start having these identifiers. They're simple, but they're there. They weren't there before. You were whatever your group was. And then that can get expanded. I think that's the hard part of the, the, the diagrams. That perspective can be expanded Vert, uh, horizontally, including adding time as an element. So now you can look back at your past and get a sense of who you were. You can look at yourself now and you can project into the future, at least, you know, let's say a decade. And you can express your goals and your achievements. And it has a totally different flavor than the earlier, the stage just before. So does that mean, um, cause like I'm looking then at, uh, like the fourth person perspective, um, and that is what would be coming online after being able to reflect on yourself kind of as a, as an In some, on And on others too, you can learn typologies. You can understand other human being. It's a very rational stage, stage four, really capable and productive in that sense. The whole basic uh, traditional scientific method is based on stage four-ish kinds of approaches to whatever you study. Hmm. And then and then with autonomous stage five, the strategist, uh, that's an expanded fourth person perspective. And in, in, in what sense is it expanded? So the fourth person perspective is the first that can look at the whole uh, way we have been uh, acculturated. You can look at the system of a society, not just a, a smaller group of it, but can see, oh my God, I have actually been brainwashed. Mm. 
to believe certain things because they were there from the first breath I took or even before. They would, and, and that is a great liberation and also separates you from most of the other people. So mm-hmm. it's, it's a tough stage to be in. We have two forms of it. Those who are more interested in, in individual growth and exploring their own inner world and how they operate and, and what we call the pluralists, which are more the mm. idealism about you know embracing every human being, having all the voices heard, those kinds of things. Yeah. Um, this is interesting, too, because this ties, I think, into the language bit, because one of the things that becomes very tempting to do uh, is to tie these ego uh, stages to cultural uh, codes or to different, you know, like modern, postmodern, yes. et cetera. Yes. And in some ways, this can be if it's I think it, this can be done in a very problematic way. But in another sense, if you just think a bit about it from kind of a linguistic standpoint, it it could make a lot of sense at some level, because what you're doing, I, the way I think about it is that, you know, when we get socialized, we get socialized using language. And so depending on the language that we're using to make sense of ourselves and the world, uh, we're going to be sort of like a feedback loop with the rest of society, taking things in. And then so I form my own ego identity using the language of my society. Is that a decent framing for how this could be tied to, to broader cultural trends? I think it's a, it's a good hypothesis. What I've always bothered me a little bit when the, this connection between individual and cultural or societal development is too tight. Mm-hmm. When they say this is the same as the other, it isn't in my view. And right. you can see that, I don't know, you know, spiral dynamics. Yeah, sure. So, or no, let's take uh, Wilbur. You have amber and then orange. And yet those two stages <laughs> and everything in between makes up 80% of all Western adults. Mm. So why do you have four or five stages above and several below and where there are most people, you have two stages? Mm. That just never made any sense to mm. me. Mm-hmm. And I think ego development has that middle as a real stage and a lot of people and a lot of what's happening in the world is based on that stage, on experts, Mm -hmm. the programming, AI, you know, all the technology stuff is is often uh, produced by people from that stage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The the in-between. So it just seems that we can't just say the parallel each other completely but yeah right. of course it has something to do as societies and languages evolve people influenced by them and influence it back yeah i mean now one of the the ways of thinking about this issue that i found uh potentially helpful uh and want to get your thoughts on it is um if you can in a sense, do an analysis of cultural codes in in relationship to their kind of relative complexity, which I think is sort of the work that, you know, the quote unquote Hansi Freinacht work is exploring, right? It's like, let's take uh, the commons model of hierarchical complexity and let's try to suggest that this these are these correspond to individual uh, kind of levels of complexity in linguistic codes. It would seem like this could pair very well with what we were just talking about if it panned out that way. Are you familiar with that idea? And and, and do you think that there's anything to looking at it through I that lens? I'm not familiar with that particular idea, but I have reacted in some ways and against the purely cognitive approach to, yeah. to things because it simply doesn't describe human experience. You can be very, very smart, and we know people who are very high IQ <laughs> yeah. And yet, as human beings, they lack a lot of empathy. They lack insight into their own inner world. Even they're just able to to, to think complexly and master co- text uh, tests that measure that. Right. 
But, it, but now this is like, a very, yeah. ah, look at me how smart I am. I totally agree. And I think this is a really interesting and crucial point. But I feel like I've seen people deal with it in different ways. So for example, Zach Stein makes this point. Uh, but the way he approaches it is to then, yes, he acknowledges that there is cognitive complexity, but then he has these two other elements of his sort of meta psychological model of like insolment and, and transcendence. Um, and so you could think about it as like you add on top of cognitive complexity, these other things. Another way no. is, is is sort of what you're doing, which is like being more holistic about it and saying, no, oh, if, we, if we're cool. carving out cognitive complexity, we're missing something else. But they seem to be trying to grapple with this same problem, which is that we can identify cognitive complexity, but it doesn't capture everything. So what is, you know, what else is going on? But I guess just first of all, do, do you think that that is an accurate description of different ways of approaching that problem and that you would identify as trying to do something more holistic? It's a suitable way. Yes, of course. Of course, and the, there are in our field, there are differences, those that truly believe the cognitive complexity is the important things. And when you think of the whole new notion of, it used to be transformational, now we call it vertical. Hmm. And vertical has all the, uh, what's it, the baggage of, of weird, you know, onward and upward, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> Western baggage basically about what's important uh, and yes it's it, in some situation it's good to be post-conventional or post-modern or metamodern or whatever you want to call it for certain tasks mm -hmm. in certain situations you need a few people who can handle that but you don't need the whole population to reach those levels and try to move them there mm -hmm. yeah. and, and, sure. you know reward them and and promise that then their lives will be easier they won't yeah well i guess the question then for me is if you're going to do something more holistic um how do you avoid the hmm, there's a couple of issues here one is that people can critique that is that you're combining you're kind of smashing together too many aspects of development that should be parsed out and recognized as separate um, so that's kind of one potential question I would pose to you is like how you would address that. Another thing too, is that if you're talking about ego development, it would almost seem to lend itself even more to kind of a onward and upwards approach of like, well, I want my, I want the most advanced ego, right? So yeah, those would be two questions. People, all people who hear about developmental theory, of course, hope to, to move along. We don't actually use the spiral. We use an arc to de represent mm -hmm. the, the development. Up to stage four or modernism, it's a, a, a further and further differentiation and creating your own separate self. And afterwards is a continuous deconstruction of that idea that I'm actually a separate self. And the more, seeing more and more really and feeling more and being more aware of your inner life, all of that increases on the other side of the arc. And actually the arc, one can imagine there is development, upward evolution and involution. It actually goes back to the beginning if you want a more spiritual, you know, interpretation. Mm -hmm. To me, it's all interpretation. Mm -hmm. Humans in their throes of map making of trying to understand what's going on mm -hmm. yeah i that's a question too um is that you know the work of ken wilbur draws a lot on different developmental models your work seems interesting correct me if i'm wrong i know you said you started in the 70s uh but it seems like what i've read of yours largely uh is already working with wilbur as an influence uh, so I'm kind of curious uh, if they're like, when, when did you discover Wilbur and when did when did Wilbur's thinking about development? Start I to read I, his transformation of consciousness, I think, in when it first came out. And I was very impressed. And the thing I liked most about it was a piece by Engler, who said, in order to transcend, you have to have it first. You have to have an ego before you can transcend. And that is so often misunderstood. People yearn, honestly, so much for the, the what they imagine, the peace and the 
the beauty will be, the bliss will be if they're transcending, while they have not actually developed the stable, you know, mature ego. Mm. Um, and that has stuck with me really as a very important piece of my understanding of things. You can't let go what you don't have. Mm -hmm. Back to this idea of, of it being kind of a whole person model and a holistic approach to these things. Um, how did how would you see this relates to Piaget's work in terms of um, he he of course both explored the cognitive side but also looked at sort of the moral aspect and the landscape there and then of course with Kohlberg furthering mm -hmm. that do you um, do you see this as being uh, highly resonant with that broader tradition or do you see it as i don't know breaking from it in any meaningful way i, I see it as a, as a grounding i mean piaget basically started his research with children with, with his own kid mm -hmm. and he came and with all his i actually met him in in uh, in geneva when i was a student at the university of zurich so we we are all pr swiss are proud of his <laughs> <laughs> work mm. and I feel and then they come the whole post-piagetting area of which Commons was also a major voice realizing that adults develop beyond formal operations some anyway and then studying the, the, the post-formal the post-conventional all the words we've used for that the the, uh, the post-modern and that has been vital. So I think it's a, just a grounding for all these series in some ways. Uh, I yeah. would I would certainly think I'm a Piagetian in some ways. Yeah. How do you think, well, this gets to the application of these sorts of, of models. Um, you know, people, I think, raise a lot of concern uh, around using any kind of developmental stage model in a normative way. And I was curious what you think about that critique. Should these models be used to frame things like in any kind of prescriptive way? Do they help us understand what we maybe should be doing or orienting towards, or are they just kind of purely descriptive data? I wouldn't say an either or thing. They're both useful to understand certain things. Some people do grow by just reading uh, you know, an interesting paper. There's something that resonates with them and they say, oh yeah, I've never looked at it that way. There's a piece there that is new to me that if I, that they feel will help their understanding. And certainly not normative. We use the map test only as a, a start of a dialogue. And we never say you're at this stage. Nobody is at one stage. Mm. Or, Every map I've ever done, and they have done over 10,000, <laughs> there is a spread, there's a mm -hmm. distribution, and people have access to different uh, levels. Yeah. Now, there is a predominant one, usually, the one they're most automatically using, but that doesn't mean they don't have access to a little later, and they have the whole range below them as well. So we're talking about that, not about and how to integrate. Yeah. No, thank you. That That's another thing I really wanted to get into is uh, apart from the, these being whole person stage models, there's also this question of can a person is a person at a stage and no. the problem that so talk about how, how we think how, sh how we should think about that. Because, as you say, there's a distribution, but there's also maybe a cluster in a particular area mm. that people are distributed towards. And that can be maybe a meaningful uh, thing to consider. But how can a person's ego you know, how can that not be a particular stage, right? How can my ego like be at different stages? Can you explain that a little bit? Let me just uh, check in myself for a minute. How would I say that? The ego is, in me, my perspective, is the, always the storyteller. It always tries to, as I said earlier, it always tries to map reality always tries to make sense of whatever appears earlier on it's just the external world it kind of can examine later on it can look at the inner world as well and constantly checking does it make sense and when it doesn't make sense there are multiple ways we can either ignore that we can numb ourselves to it 
we can start kind of playing with it a little bit, but still remaining where we are. You know, that's the base. That's where we're solid, the automatic way. And sometimes we, there are methods and experiences that transform, that we suddenly say, oh, my God, there's a whole new world. I can see everything below me or next to me, whichever way you want to look at it. And, and that's rarer. We yeah. always grow uh, horizontally. We learn new, new facts. We learn new methods. We learn, you know, we expand our, where we are. But transformation is rarer. Yeah, so that brings me to my next question. And here I want to get into a little bit some of the methods here, which I think is really important, right? So as you say, I mean, there's there's a learning process going on here and we can learn horizontally. I can acquire new facts, but it's a different thing to do that transformative thing and kind of gain a new vantage. So what is like the criteria for assessing, I guess, ultimately when, you're, when you are actually uh, looking at data, when you're exhibiting uh, these these tests or what have you, or analyzing them, how do you how do what's the criteria for like ranking something as being representing a, a higher vantage versus just more information? How do you do a kind of you know vertical assessment of that? Each stage has its own new capacities, and we're looking for those. What can this person now handle or do or envision or uh, critique that they were before not able to do. That's the way you do that. And some of it is structural. If you can, for instance, compare, if, if you are at the either or stage, you can see two things, but you can be at the both and stage where you can coordinate two opposing kinds of ideas or feelings in yourself. And that seems to be later. And you have the word and or whereas would be a mm. paralleling to while is another sort of little word that yeah. if you use it, it, it indicates that you can coordinate two things. But now this, this to me sounds like cognitive complexity. So how is it not uh, reducible to that? Uh, cognitive complexity, as Wilbur also says, is a, is a leader. If you don't have certain level of compl <laughs> complexity, you probably won't grow in that way. I grew up with a Down syndrome sister, so I'm very, very familiar what it means to not have the cognitive capacity to even play with ideas. That's simply not available. So yes, that is a, a, a driver, but it's not enough. Yeah. Um, well, I want to maybe come back to that because I want to say then what, you know, when you say it's not enough, like what else is going on there? Because uh, I feel like that there's there's a lot that I think folks in this community would benefit from really trying to tease that that stuff out. But I also wanted to ask you this, which I think is really important. Um, these are sentence completion tests, uh, et cetera. And so, again, we're in the realm of language. But now now that ideas are out there floating in the world, um, someone might have access to the notion that like, oh, um, two things uh, can both be true, even though they're contradictory or something like that, right? I mean, with a lot of, say, postmodern cultural code, you get the notion that like truth is relative and the ego is a construct and stuff like that. And people can hear that. They can say those words, but it's different to like embody that, okay. you know, and so with that. So how yes. do you how do you how do you analyze the difference between a sentence completion test where someone writes that but you know yeah because I guess if you've been trained and listened enough you can notice when it's what we call aboutism I I I kind of hypothesize that from stage four on once you've re achieved stage four and the rational analytical you can basically learn any theory. And you can then reproduce it as a theory. But of course, that is not at all a, a sign that you embody it. That comes across in being able to question even the stems in the test. That's a very good sign when somebody actually reacts to the stem, not by just rejecting it. That's earlier. You know, I just don't want to hear of a man's <laughs> job. There's no men and there's no jobs and there's no man job. That will be early. But mm. a th more thoughtful challenge to, the, to that or a culturally 
were challenged to that stem. That is a sign of later. Um, I see. This way I hear it. Uh, yeah. Also, how much you actually refer to your own inner world, to your feelings, to being able to say that that stem, just as an example, is upsetting to me to read in this day and age. Mm. Something like that, mm -hmm. that, to refer to the how it feels. Mm -hmm. Or even when that, you say that, my body reacts, I cringe, I don't want to hear it. So you have all of it, you have the feeling, the body, all in that one response. Mm. And we look at those as more integrated than somebody who doesn't talk about it sort of in abstract terms. Yeah. I mean, could you, is there any way that the the very language formulations themselves uh, factor into this? Um, you know, the difference between someone saying, uh, you know, basically giving a very simple articulation of a complex idea versus giving a very complex articulation of a complex idea. Um, as you can see, I keep going back to complexity. So that's probably my <laughs> well, That's own. where you were at home, I guess. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> uh, yes, because when we train people, that's one of the tasks they have to learn is to respond to these stage stems themselves in, in, in a layered fashion. What makes it different? That's part of the training. How, how is it different? And we can show that the manuals we use. For every idea, there is a, a consecutive list of what people might say and have said. And then you compare mm -hmm. actually what they say to the manuals mm -hmm. and their rules and uh, how to combine sentences and all of that. But that's just the technicalities of yeah, uh, learning how to score. Yeah, I mean, on those methodological questions, I, I'm interested. So where is this work at right now? Are you still training people? Are you still conducting multiple tests? Or because um, I just looked at the copyrights. And of course, your dissertation, I think, was from 99. And the nine levels uh, came out in 20, or at least was published online in 2013. So that was about 10, uh, you know, 10 years ago. Where's, where's this work at now? What sort of stuff is being done with it? Uh, mostly Vertical Development Academy does still train. Uh, we haven't trained anybody in scoring, partially because they, nobody has the time. It's such an intensive scoring. It takes so much energy and time of people who, who want to do it that, that it's hard to even organize. So I'm not doing it. Bina Sharma has plans to do it, but we haven't started yet. Um, I write, I'm, I'm trying to write two books. You know, I'm, I'm old enough. I'm what I call semi-retired, but I'm still doing interviews. I'm still scoring particular research projects. I have now one where that's really tough to score because the people are, some of them are so... Uh, how shall I say, they're so uh, consumed with thinking of themselves as already having transcended and being enlightened uh -huh. that, yeah, it's just very tough because who am I to in judge somebody's huh. enlightenment is part of the reaction. Hmm. And another part is I can and I hate to say it, but you're not... <laughs> <laughs> you're not, from what you have written, you probably are not. I mean, I'm not saying that to them. It's research. Yeah. So like, I say it to the researchers, not to the person. But it's the, the other thing is that as well. Who am I to judge? And this really sounds like somebody has eaten the transcendental Kool-Aid. I can't <laughs> help Yeah. Well, this is, it, this is very interesting. Because on the one hand, it's like... Um... The ethical implications of of this research. I mean, uh, this research seems to me to have direct bearings on all sorts of really important aspects of human culture. On, at the same yeah. time, 
it uh because of that almost it's like despite or because of that it um it's very dangerous how it gets applied and how it gets used yes and, uh, yes yes so i see that i see that tension uh playing out in a lot of contexts um and uh so i just wanted to kind of note that and i find that very interesting but the other thing i wanted to i guess see if i can probe a little more into is that there does seem to be this like what to me lands is a kind of obscure veil that I'm trying to break through, which is like, ah, well, the answers are all in the training and the answers are in the the manual and this sort of a thing. It seems like there's this whole kind of um, depth or initiation process or something that one has to go through. But I, I, I want to... I want to also just know like the principles or the, th or the theory, right? Because one of the concerns would be, um, and I think this gets to the, the issue you're raising. It's like, well, who am I to assess someone's enlightenment or this or that? It's like, well, all that would seem to hinge on the theory and the, and the, the theorizing, uh, the ranking system and the whole kind of methodology behind it. Right. Um, so maybe the simplest way to ask this question is like, where could I go to find that, to learn that? Do I need to get the manual to to dig into that material? We don't even share the manual. <laughs> okay, so there you go. Yeah, you know. Really, yes, you, it's an interesting point you point you bring up here. The, the kind of, it's also that the last, I would say, 10 years or so, I actually focused on other things. Mm. The critique of the field as a whole, because it's very, very weird, mm. very Western <laughs> industry. All of those, the, mm. you know, the abbreviation. Um, it, it, it's so much so that it, it takes enormous effort to even bring it up in so many of the current big endeavors. It's big. I try. <laughs> That's what I see my job right now is to be a bridge builder and to open up people, the Western mind to the idea that, yes, these theories are wonderful and they explain a lot, particularly in the Western world or the modern world, but they are limited. They, they present human beings in a very certain way. That, well, that's one of the things when you look at the arc, we start out saying you, you're born and then you get acculturated and brainwashed. And then you eventually come to the idea that all human beings are connected to the rest of everything else. Interdependence from dependence to independence to interdependence. But so many cultures, particularly indigenous ones, start out with the interdependence with everything mm -hmm. and the taking care of it. So they're better at sustainability than we have ever been. We're exploiters. Mm. The whole you know, world is trying to get more resources for humans and, and, and has exploited. I mean, we know the trouble we are in about that. Um, well, what, what do you make of uh, another common critique? Um, I guess it's a fairly common one. It's certainly the most uh, pointed or barbed one, which is that uh, stage um, models are uh, sort of essentially neo-colonialist and uh, oppressive and uh, this and that. What, what's sort of your reaction to that? I would say neo-colonialist and not necessarily oppressive. It depends. Again, you said that earlier we do require that somebody who learns this whole thing needs to be at least post-conventional. Mm. You can't train, because that's one of the tenets, I think, of all the theories, that you cannot understand what is later, but later can understand earlier. So that's a prerequisite, so that you do have some, some insight in who you are. You have to... <laughs> You have to have been, you know, sure. experienced the whole thing as well on yourself. Just, just to clarify, though, were you saying that you're saying that that stage models are neo-colonialist or that they can be? Well, I wasn't sure exactly. I think uh, every the models are colonial, uh, colonialist. I think English is a colonizing factor, if you mm -hmm. think of it. So um, how do you then, how do you square that with I mean you are a, a stage theorist but I don't think you would identify <laughs> as a neo colonialist so how does that square Well I don't I I certainly in, in identify with saying I'm thoroughly weird hmm. 
But I do have, and that, that's my recommendation to anybody who is dealing with these kinds of questions, whenever you have the slightest question, but you have to be able to question yourself, to, to, to think something or say something, ask yourself, is that coming from my weird place or mm -hmm. is, that, is there an opening? I don't think you can change. I, I think I talked this morning to somebody. How do we change? How do we get rid of colonial thinking? We mm. can't get rid of it. We can become more aware of how we are doing this and how pernicious it is in us. It is in the again, it's in the language, it's in 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 the metaphors we use, it's everywhere. We just can't help it. But this, so I, I think this this warrants some doubling down and trying to really unpack this because it's really important. And uh, uh, can you clarify a little bit what you mean though? Because I I don't think you're saying, but I maybe you are. But so let me know. But I don't think you're saying, yeah, all this stuff is neo colonialist. But you know that's just the way it is, and so someone's got to do it, sort of a thing. But you are acknowledging some some weirdness to it. So uh, I guess maybe the question there is like, how do we acknowledge the weirdness? How do we acknowledge the potential for neocolonial aspects to, to this, but then yet move beyond that or still engage it ethically? Or I don't know, some series of questions around that. That are the questions I'm grappling with right now on mm. several uh, areas. Uh, yeah. How do we be more cognizant of how how much even these theories are embedded in that kind of thinking. And, you know, higher is better, or maybe not. Uh, <laughs> maybe there are other ways, there are other cosmologies that place human beings not at the center of everything, but in connection with everything. Mm. And that... Uh, I have been working with the in the development goals mm -hmm. and we, again critiqued some of it because because it was so western because all the research original research was done with northern european countries and it was beautiful research and it was so limited it did not take into account other kinds of ways of looking at values for instance it just didn't yeah, and the, so now we're in a third phase where that's hopefully hopefully is going to happen. But it so, started out neo-colonistic. Yeah, does the uh, does the ego storyteller then of uh, Susan Cook Greuter reassess her life uh, as you know what how, I've I've done so much with the uh, developmental stage theory and now the way that you're questioning all this is it sort of like is this creating a moment of transformation for you or is there some way that this is being integrated in some higher <laughs> level? Where... I don't know whether it's higher. It, I think it's in integrated because I'm happy with what work we have I've done and been able to do and figure things out in the traditional way of you know academic figuring things out I think what we have figured out is fairly uh, valid and stable and helpful mostly that's practical and helpful to people and there is more and right now I really enjoy writing a fable with a colleague a younger colleague in Australia, that go. Oh, I live near Walden Pond, just mm, five miles from it. So cool. it's very part of my daily existence. So we're writing it with animals. Each animal represents a stage, hmm. and it's it's a community. Mm -hmm. And my colleague is the traveling otter from. It's a sea otter from Australia. And I'm the resident owl. Nice. Old owl. And so I invite him to stay and learn about all the different animals with their mm. different values. And we stress, we stress, we stress what they contribute mm -hmm. to the community, not what's wrong with them. Not you ought to be different. If you're a fox, you're a fox. That's just mm. what you are. And it has benefits. And it has some drawbacks, of course, but the, the emphasis on 
the community and understanding the differences and respecting and valuing them even, not to say you should be different than you are. So that's really a joyful uh, aspect of what we're doing. I don't and know. I'm sounds sure. really green to me. No, I'm just kidding. Well, <laughs> totally it kidding. probably is. And it's totally meant, <laughs> and if it is perfectly fine, what we hope is that some people who normally would not read this sort of thing in the dialogues we do and the little stories we tell, we hope people find a resonance. And so far they do. Yeah. You know, when we, when I haven't yet, but my colleague has run it by some of his relatives or even his kids. Mm -hmm. And they say, oh, yes, now I understand. Mm. That would be the reaction we would hope to get. I, I, and then I've been trying to write the eco development <laughs> book for years <laughs> and years. And I now have a, a long introduction, basically critiquing, saying, yes, it's fine as it stands, and it, it's just biased like all the others. Hmm. It's just not enough. It's very interesting. I mean, I think all this just really does get at the heart of some very profound philosophical issues, right? That has to deal with value, um, ethics, normativity, yes. prescription, that sort of a thing. Um, I mean, you know, one of the things that I think attracts a lot of people myself included, I guess I'll admit, to whole developmental models is is the, the suggestion that we might be able to ground or meaningfully frame uh, normativity in what is, right? They're sort of like, oh, we can make, you know, I think uh, Kohlberg named uh, one of his books uh, where the subtitle of it was like, how to commit the, the naturalistic fallacy and get away with it, right? How do we just say <laughs> that the is is the ought and that those things are tied together? Because if we could do that, we could really, um, uh, at, at a time when this kind of radical relativism seems to be able to justify any amount Maybe, of, yes. you know, nonsense. Well, it's like, you know. That's the danger. That is the danger of that early realization that what I've learned is not real. Yeah. There's all kinds of ideas out there. And you haven't integrated that. It's just, oh, my God, it's all relative. Yes, there's a huge danger in that. Yeah. I mean, I think I look out and I see, you know, alternative facts and the whole Trump thing and this whole kind of grievance <laughs> politics and all this stuff of people. It's like, oh, well, everything's relative and everything that and not only that, but um, the justifications that people can see in their own blindness for doing things like I think it's very atrocious what's happening with the environment, you know, and like needing to do that. But then if you just you know, what what avenues do we have to make sense of that that aren't judgmental in some way? You know, how do we not say normatively we shouldn't be trashing the environment? It seems like we're we're forced to, out of our own kind of need to survive, to exist and persist, make certain claims about what we should be doing. Um, and I, I, I've been attracted myself to framing development more, uh, more gently as like, yeah, not everyone had the privilege to be able to to understand the influences that they have on the environment or, you know, to be able to see people's blind spots, but not blame them for them, but to be able to contextualize people's behavior to be more kind of e empathetic. Um, but that still is a normative claim. You know, it's like it's still better that we don't trash the environment, it's still better that we see our webs of relationship and this and that. Um so I think it gets to some really profound issues of like, how do we get to do that as we must um, if 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 making normative claims of any kind is is problematic or something? I don't know. That's maybe a philosophical question. I don't know if you have any thoughts on it. <laughs> uh, I, what I've learned for myself is simply to be conscious to not to trash things. And I grew up in a working class family where we learned very early and very cleverly, I still enjoy it, to reuse, repurpose, to change, to, to do, be frugal, to, to make things do. And that's, of course, daily I go get bombarded with advertisements that say more, 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 more mm. this, more that. Get by, by that, that to me is so deeply, again, ingrained in capital, maybe in other, I don't know the other systems, but anything that has a modern feel mm -hmm. says that, mm -hmm. tries you to overconsume and get into debt and all of that. And, and 
I don't know what I can tell other people than good enough is good enough. Yeah. Enough Do you think, is yeah. enough. You don't Do you... need more, constantly more. You can reuse it or repurpose it or play with it. Do any kinds of things with it. That That's a an idea that I guess learned in childhood and still feel is a good one. It's a, a it's one that helps the whole thing. I don't know about the big world. I don't see myself as somebody who can influence the larger streams in, in that kind of thing. I can talk about it. I can talk about how upsetting it is to me that billions are spent on trying to get to outer space and conquer, we do the all conquering thing that we've done forever and not just the colonizers, the earlier uh, civilizations did the same thing. This is not, this is human nature. Yeah, and I mean, that's I, a strong statement, but I do feel yeah. sometimes we, we focus only on the colonizing factor from the, from the Renaissance on, you know, when we could take ships and go and uh, conquer other. But it, the earlier civilizations did the very same things. They enslaved others, they did everything also. Right. Humans have always tried to conquer new territory. Now we're going to other planets in order to exploit the potentially natural resources that we have depleted here. That's where I get honestly sometimes upset, that there's no recognition of that that those billions could be used for making life on this earth better. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I, I, I have no influence. Well, what I, other than speaking about it, I have no ways of changing it. Well, I was actually saying it's interesting. Uh, two things. One is I think you have a lot of influence. I mean, your work has contributed to, you know, uh, a a broader developmentally informed and spiritually interested movement in culture that um i think has had a great influence um you know and your work has been seen by thou thousands if not millions of people especially through your relationship with uh you know w integral and or at least ken wilber's relationship with your work let's say um so anyway just just as a, an observation but what i wanted to say was that so i totally agree with you but then all that leads me to want to say, yeah, that's bad. Like, we shouldn't do that. We should not do that, right? There's a normative, prescriptive, axiological okay. claim. Yes. And then I want to make, because then this becomes the issue, right, is that when we live in the world that we live in, people will say, well, that's just your opinion, man. And I want to say, no, it's like it's rooted in reality. And I, I think that there's an attraction to developmental theory because it's like, it allows us to maybe think about that, right? It's like, oh, if we can see that some people are lack the perspective maybe on their own behavior or on others, and that that leads to things like colonization, that leads to things like the enslavement of other people, et cetera. But that if you can gain perspective and be able to appreciate, oh, wow, this is another human being with their own interior yes. world, then like that will actually make the world more ethical and better. And that is what I see as the potential promise of development. But then I see these critiques leveled at it as no it's inherently colonialist and destructive and we need to break it down and i'm like well but this this could be the key so i don't know this is my thoughts. well listen though as you say when somebody says it's automatically says it's automatically neo-colonial that to me is then i listen often when i read whatever it is or, mm. or even other theories i listen to the tone how tightly does the person hold her her or his or them beliefs mm. And that the way you quoted it is a very tightly held belief. Mm. And it doesn't allow for any kind of reflection or, or change in, in it. That's part of the, uh, the interesting facet of postmodernism is that it is not aware of its performative contradiction. Right. Right. Well, that's exactly it. it. And that, then that's it's like what you have there as yeah. well. Right. So uh Again, I think you you mentioned it. To me, it is important wisdom and compassion, and that is not so tightly related to stage. Mm. There are people who are at early stages who are wonderfully compassionate and wise in some ways. Mm. 
Maybe they don't influence the whole world, but they influence those around them, their circle, their family. They make a big, huge difference. And that's another part of that, being more appreciative of all levels, if yeah. you want to think in his hierarchical things, as important and contributing to the well-being of the whole. Yeah, definitely. Do you think, though, that developmental theories have something to tell or to teach us about ethics? Uh, yes. <laughs> Again, how well, how aware are you of the limits of your own thing and the damage that your own convictions might do yeah. is an important aspect of what I would call wisdom. Mm. Um, and if you don't, if you really... Uh, propagate your idea and as the end result, as the solution to everything that ails humanity, then you're, in my view, not ethical and not very uh, insightful or yeah. wise. Yeah, interesting. But, um, fascinating. But I'm never issues. sure. I doubt. <laughs> yeah, well, there I, always I, needs I to be. I should have started. I'm a skeptic and I have yeah. always been a skeptic of my own ideas, which is in some ways uh, helping. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes makes my life harder. It's yeah. easier if you have strong convictions in one way or the other. Yeah, I was actually going to ask you that. I was going to wonder if, um, I mean, you've been doing this for so long and you've seen the intricacies of it and you've, you've you know, assessed thousands and thousands of tests, et cetera. Um, I was wondering how that all lands for you at this point. Like, like if someone were to just be like, no, you're wrong. <laughs> I mean, apart from whatever they're coming from, like, uh, is there a part of you that would just be like, no, <laughs> I've done this. I've seen there's something like there's a there there that you're, that you're there, 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 but it's limited. I say yeah. you may be you. Yeah. This is only for a particular usage. Yeah. It's good. It's not globally right or or you know and and there are good reasons to be skeptical of it try it out on yourself see what it does to you take a test and have a debrief mm. and see whether something occurs to you whether something changes something uh we never do the test on in research we do but not in in real life in in corporate contexts and with individuals without debriefing what mm -hmm. happened and often there is it's not the same sometimes somebody who tests at a certain level when you actually speak to them in dialogue they are a little later mm. you uh, think for various reasons yeah they're, they're, there's just uh i don't i i often am stumped with mm. the kind of questions because i don't know my best intention is to be kind and understanding and to not overvalue my own uh, place, my own position, my own yeah. thing, but it being inquiry. Well, I, I greatly admire With and respect your, your well, I won't humility. I much more about you. Sure. <laughs> well, um, another question, uh, we should probably wrap this up soonish, but just a few more quick thoughts if you have a minute, is, um, is there something that is so specifically... Uh, at least potentially dangerous with developmental thought that maybe there is something to the folks who just say this just shouldn't be done. You know, uh, do you, what do you make of an argument like that? They're like, because of how it could be uh, abused and misused that it just should be off the table. Have you ever experienced uh, your own work being like misused or, or ha had to deal with the fact that people use your work um, in a way that you feel like isn't, uh, you know, uh, appropriate or anything like that? Is that something you've grappled with in any way or? Um... I have in the past. Uh, I, I'm no longer trying to be, <laughs> to be the eco development police. <laughs> yeah. But I think the most problem I've had with people who are very cognitively clever mm. and use it then in some ways to manipulate. Mm. But, you know, again, it, it, humans are so varied and do things if they bring out the theory and, and even one person out of 10 gets in a heart and that's okay with me nowadays it used to not it used to upset me but yeah. I, I just let it be sometimes it's like children who grow up 
they, they go their own way. They <laughs> develop in different ways. You can't all keep it in, you know, under yeah. control. Right. Yeah. Um, well, I, for one, love your work. I think it's deeply valuable. Um, and uh, yeah, I think at the very least, it's it's a lot of, um, uh, it, it provides a lot of really important ideas to think about, to, to mull over, to, um, you know, to sit with and to contemplate um, beyond just the fact that I feel like obviously there, the, well, I shouldn't say, obviously, I do think that there's, you're, there's a there there to this stuff. You know, I think it's, uh, it's getting at something yes. real, okay. however much there might be elements that are left out of these uh, models that are also very important. Um, but I just wanted to say that too, because I've been asking you a lot of questions, you know, about these critiques that come up because I feel they, they energize this community in an important way. I think they're important yes. for honing our own thoughts about these things. And yes. I think it's always very important to continually, uh, yeah, be self-critical, uh, and to foreground that rather than run from it. And, um, I think, you know, you're, you're a particularly just notable and respected person in this field. And so I appreciate the way you uh, present this material and the the care and the the depth that you bring to it. So um, anyway, is there anything else that uh, you'd want to throw into the mix here before we wrap up? Anything that you want to say that didn't come out or even just to talk a little bit about what it is that you're working on? You mentioned you're writing two books and that's exciting. Well, one is the ego development book that I promised for I don't know how uh -huh. long. <laughs> and because now I'm doing other things, I need to frame it. And, and it's it's big. And then I say that all these things are out, out there. Why should I write, spend energy on mm -hmm. writing them again? <laughs> so I'm not sure. But the joyful one is the, the fable. That one I truly uh, I'm engaged in. And it sounds like you're working with the ego development goals, folks, but that that is also still something that is coming together and, and it's not yet final. Is there anything you can say about kind that, of... You mean the, the, in, the individual... The, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't, no, the inner, inner development. Inner development. Yeah. And I work a bit with the flourishing project, the Harvard-Oxford one, that, which has also more of values, but it's more research oriented than the IDGs. The IDGs is full of well meaning volunteers. I mean, really, I'm, mm. I'm totally in awe of that. Mm. And it's not terribly scientific yet. Mm. It still has uh, work to do in terms of exploring other other values <laughs> interesting but well i'm glad to hear that you're bringing uh that perspective to that and i know i believe also robert keegan is involved with that project correct he was yes he yeah. is yeah. he's more of a like because he's a professor he's more not i'm a worker he is more a holder of the, uh -huh. the thing well um yeah i i'm intrigued i haven't delved much into that you know um uh, set of material yet though i've i've heard both positive and negative things and uh so it's exciting to hear that there's still work being done in that front uh and the people who are involved with it are also aware of some of these things and maybe could yes. you know get the the best out of that um and uh yeah well anyway i'd also just say one more thing to the to the independent scholars that you know you know yes. just because right. we're not in academia doesn't mean we uh we're we any don't less... have something to contribute exactly yeah yes, so I, yes. i'll support that yes yes that. yes i agree with you fully there <laughs> <laughs> well susan cook writer thank you so much it's a wonderful conversation i really appreciate you uh, taking the time to talk with me thanks for having me